In some ways, Australia reminds me of this glass bowl, which contains stones and a layer of plasticine or modelling clay on top. Why? I'm glad you asked. Because water is not only in the rivers and streams and lakes that you see around you, but water can also be under the ground, in layers of rock that have spaces between the solid bits. And this layer of stones represents a layer of such rock. It's called permeable rock. It allows water to flow through it, and you can see there's some water in there already. However, not all rock allows water to pass through. Some is quite solid. And the glass bowl itself represents a layer of such rock, impermeable rock. And the layer of modelling clay represents another layer of impermeable rock. Now let's imagine that it rains thousands of kilometres away in the mountains. Now the rain seeps into the permeable rock and it flows. It may take years to flow all the way, but it's filling up that space. Now nothing is happening in the centre of this dry continent. However, there's water under the ground. And if we sink a well by drilling through the impermeable rock, let's see what happens. Down we go, and look at that. We have a well and we have water coming out of it. It's called an artesian well. Now the water doesn't always spring up out of the well like that. Sometimes you have to pump it to the surface. But in any event, you can get water in dry places, even in the very centre of the dry continent of Australia, in places such as Alice Springs, sitting directly over the Amadeus Basin. But to get to that water-bearing rock, the aquifer, we need to drill through the top layer of the sandwich, about 100 metres of solid rock. Now, in order to drill through the rocks, one of these steel pipes is placed vertically and a drill bit screwed onto the end of it. It may be a large drill bit like this with cone-shaped gadgets with teeth on them. That's called a tricone roller bit. Let me show you how it works. Here's a smaller one. As it rotates, those toothed wheels also rotate, cutting through the rock. Now, they're constantly monitoring the sort of rock they're going through. They blow air down the centre of the pipe. That pushes the rock samples up. They collect them in a little bag, test them out, and work out what sort of drill bit they need. For certain kinds of rock, they may need to actually hammer their way through. So they use a tungsten button hammer bit, and that pounds its way through as well as turning. For other kinds of rock, they may need a diamond drill bit. This drill bit actually has thousands of little industrial diamonds embedded in the cutting face, and that's very efficient for cutting its way through hard rock. The layers of permeable rock which contain water may be hundreds or even thousands of metres below the surface of the earth. So the drills need to be lengthened as they go down. At regular intervals, new sections of pipe or shaft are attached at the top. Each section is screwed and welded into position. So the drill is now pushing down through the impermeable layer into the permeable layer of rock which contains water. These are cores of rock which have been brought up from below. The holes and cracks in these samples show that the rock layers in this region contain water. There's the, the red mud rock, yeah. and we can see a few uh, worm burrows there where little worm burrows have um, burrowed uh, through the sand in the seashore. Um, the water's held in the uh, sand grains, between the sand grains. I must just say, uh, this is the different colours we're going through here. Yeah, that's where the uh, iron ox the iron stone has come out of the mud rock and stained the, the white rock. Now the next problem is to get water up out of the bore. There are several ways of doing this. One is to use a submersible bore pump, which consists of an electric motor right down the bottom. That drives a shaft, which turns a series of propellers, which push the water upwards. Water is actually sucked in through here. And that whole area is protected by this, a screen, which is a large cylinder with slots in the side. So it acts as a filter to keep rock fragments out of the bore. It's made of stainless steel and it's worth over $1,000. But it's a very important part of the bore because not only does it keep the water clean, but also it protects the pump from damage. 
Next, the bore pump is raised vertically and lowered carefully to the bottom of the bore. As it goes down, extra sections of pipe or bore casing are attached to it so that when the motor reaches the bottom, there's a continuous pipe coming all the way to the top. This is a completed bore head. That's the bore hole down there. Water comes up and through what's called the telephone. I think you can see why. It's shaped a little bit like a telephone receiver and then down that pipe there and away to a storage tank. Now, when the water comes up from the bore, there's air mixed with it. So there's an air valve to let the air escape. So when I switch it on in a moment, you'll hear a great rushing sound as the air comes out of the valve. It's off at the moment, but it's time to switch it on. The air's gone now, so water's flowing through the large pipe. Let's just check that out with the test tap. No doubt about it. From 17 bores around Alice Springs, water goes to four large concrete storage tanks, which together hold 90 million litres. From these storage tanks, water goes through a series of pumps, booster pumps, into the town water supply. And so we have the amazing situation in which a town of 20,000 people, Alice Springs, in the centre of Outback Australia, has a plentiful supply of pure, clean water with no restrictions whatsoever. Isn't science wonderful?